last paper of the session, last um, uh, selected paper of the conference, because we have, of course, uh, Safa's um, um, keynote. Um, we are now turning to the hottest of all topics, cybersecurity and how it will affect uh, your bank balances. Oh, no, the financial stability. Um, Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much, Thorsten, for that uh, great introduction. I hope I will do some justice to this topic. Uh, this is joint work with Chanel Dulé and Prasanna Guy, both of whom at the University of Auckland. And as usual, the, the usual disclaimer applies. Now, last year, November, um, the hacker group Lockbit conducted a cyber attack on ICBC Financial Services, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of ICBC Bank, the largest bank in the world by total assets. The attack took place whereby the hackers exploited a vulnerability in a commonly used remote desktop, desktop software called Citrix, which is used by many banks and indeed many other organizations. And this allowed them to gain access into the bank's systems and processes, including those that are used to settle repo and US Treasury transactions. And as a consequence of this, there were disruptions in Treasury markets, which were only subsequently quelled after the bank paid an undisclosed ransom to the hackers. Now, this event uh, with ICBC Financial Services highlights, and in my opinion is a harbinger for the risks posed by cyber risks uh, the risk posed by cyber attacks, I should say, on financial stability. And this issue has also been at the forefront of many uh, debates amongst policymakers um, who have come up with several different proposals on tackling the issue of, of, of cyber risks. Some, for example, have advocated uh, that one conducts a regular stress tests to assess the resilience of banks in the event of a cyber attack. So the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Bank of England have uh, recently conducted such tests in the past years. The ECB is, has just conducted or is, has just finished conducting its own such cyber resilience stress test with the aim of understanding how banks would respond and recover in the event of a cyber attack. Others, however, have advocated conducting so-called red team testing, which in effect is simulating a cyber attack on a financial institution with the goal of finding and eliminating vulnerabilities so as to boost that institution's protection against cyber attacks. Now, despite the growing interest in the topic, we don't have a framework to think through how cyber attacks might impact banks and also how banks might respond and how what they might do in terms of investing in cybersecurity. And that is where our paper comes in. We offer a model of cyber attacks and banks and banks' investments in cybersecurity. And there are two main messages that we try to develop in this paper. The first is that investment in cybersecurity is going to be subject to a novel trade-off between on the one hand, increasing protection against a possible cyber attack versus remaining resilient in the event of a cyber attack. And the second finding that we present here is that the extent to which there is either underinvestment or overinvestment in cybersecurity, and thereby the optimal sort of policy response, is going to depend on two kind of key. Uh, ingredients. The first is bank fragility, how run prone are the banks, if you will. And the second is the sophistication of the attacker. Now, arguably, these two statements are very broad and don't make a lot of sense at the moment, but hopefully through the course of this presentation, uh, they will be become more clear. So with that, let me sort of describe the model that we have here. It's a single good model that extends over three dates. T, 0, 1, and 2. There's going to be a bank that issues demandable debt to risk-neutral investors. And the face value of debt, which we endogenize, 
is going to be denoted F. Now, banks are going to use software and other IT solutions to manage their operations and balance sheets. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on what I would call in-house solutions. So these are IT systems where the bank itself is responsible for the cybersecurity. In other words, we're going to abstract from sort of third-party vendors, um, which is something that we consider in the paper, and uh, I'm happy to talk about more later. What's crucial is that these IT solutions and systems, they all have vulnerabilities within them. And what's also equally important is that very often we don't know that these vulnerabilities exist. It's not as if someone has maliciously programmed a backdoor into your system. It's just that the way these computer systems are designed, there are always things to exploit. So given this, the other final ingredient in our model is that there's going to be an attacker who's risk neutral. And the goal of the attacker is to try to find and exploit these vulnerabilities for personal gains. And this, again, is also where the key difference between cyber risks and other traditional risks comes. You have a malicious entity that is seeking to do you harm. And that's clearly not the case with market risk and credit risk and so forth. So a key idea here, and it's, don't, it's not often that you see quotes from Donald Rumsfeld, so I'm very glad to have that, is that cyber risks are known unknowns. We know that there are vulnerabilities in our system, but we don't actually know what those vulnerabilities are. And the game here is to try to find those vulnerabilities first. So I like cartoons, and here is a sort of visual description of our model. We have our attacker uh, on, on the left, right, on that side. And on this side, we have our bank uh, that has a, a unit uh, in, of funding and demandable debt. And it uses a bunch of software and IT solutions, and hidden in those is a bug. Now, the, what are the decisions here? At T-Note, the bank must invest a certain amount S in cybersecurity. What do we mean by cybersecurity? The bank can pay security experts to sort of hack into their systems to try to find those vulnerabilities. Alternatively, they can offer so-called bug bounties where they tell the public, if you report a bug in our systems, we're going to pay you a large sum of money. The remainder is going to be invested in liquid and safe assets that yield an R uh, at the final date. The attacker is going to invest an amount A to find and exploit vulnerabilities, and the marginal cost to this attacker is this parameter C, which I'm going to interpret as a measure of the sophistication of that attacker. So when C is very small, the marginal cost for, uh, from, for effort for the attacker is very low. So this is a very sophisticated attacker. Think of it as state-sponsored entities. Whereas when C is very high, the marginal cost is very high, it's more costly uh, for this entity to, um, to, to, to exert effort. So this is sort of a, a cyber criminal, if you will. And then debt, uh, finally, to kind of close the model out, is going to be pressed, uh, priced competitively given these investors outside options. Um, so again, the attacker is going to invest A to try to find this bug. The bank is going to invest S also to try to find the bug first. So there's a contest between those two. And the remainder, the bank is going to invest in these uh, assets. Now, at T1, the attacker is going to be successful in finding this vulnerability first and launching an attack with a certain probability, which is given over there. And clearly, the more the attacker has invested in trying to find this bug, the more successful they are going to be in finding that bug first. So what happens in the event of a cyber attack? The first thing we sort of assume here is that a fraction alpha of the bank's assets are going to become impaired. Um, so this is a shock to the bank's assets. If you think back to the example of uh, ICBC Financial Services, some of it, its systems got uh, sort of disrupted and were not, they could not be used. So this is sort of captures that sort of idea that your systems become impaired and you, cannot, you do not have full access to your balance sheet. Um, the attacker obtains a prize V, which for simplicity we assume is completely exogenous. So from being successful, there's a certain prize. Now, if at this point in time, 
a fraction L of the bank's depositors choose to withdraw, then the bank is going to fail due to illiquidity if its recourse to liquidity at this point in time is insufficient to pay these depositors. And this recourse to liquidity is going to be reduced by the extent to which the bank has suffered this disruption. So the bank, if the disruption is alpha, the bank has access to only one minus alpha of its balance sheet. And if that's insufficient to repay depositors, we would say that the bank fails due to illiquidity. And this allows us to define an illiquidity threshold. How do we sort of uh, model the decisions of uh, the, the, to withdraw or not? We kind of rely on this paper by Rocher and Vives, where depositors delegate the decisions to roll over to professional fund managers, whose decisions are going to be driven by what we call their conservatism. It's an exogenous parameter that's a measure of rollover risk. So the larger is this conservatism, uh, the more, greater are the incentives to withdraw. Uh, and then these fund managers are going to receive signals about the disruption. And based on this, these signals, they have to decide whether to uh, roll over or withdraw. The finally, the final date, the impairment that was caused by the cyber attack is going to be resolved. Nevertheless, banks are still going to be subject to certain deadweight losses. So again, linking back to the ICBC financial services example, there was a certain ransom that had to be paid to these attackers. So we can think of these deadly weight losses as ransom payments or alternatively loss of proprietary trading information. So taking into account these deadweight losses at the final date, the bank would fail due to insolvency if the net return on its assets is insufficient to repay the creditors. And from that, we can derive um, this insolvency threshold as well. So as before, uh, the attacker walks away with the prize. Uh, the bank suffers these deadweight losses and must repay its creditors. And the bank's equity value is what remains subject to limited liability. So we solve the model by backward induction, starting with the decisions of the fund managers to either withdraw or not and then look at sort of the bank's decision to invest in cybersecurity. And what matters for the fund manager's decisions is going to be a combination of their conservatism and whether bank failure is going to be driven by insolvency or illiquidity. So to make that clear, in this picture, I've plotted the bank's insolvency threshold as a fraction of these early withdrawals. So we can see that this is given by this horizontal line. So whenever, and on the y-axis is the, uh, the shock to the balance sheet. So whenever the shock is below this line, the bank does not fail due to insolvency. Whenever it's above, it will fail due to insolvency. I can then superimpose onto this the illiquidity threshold, which is this downward sloping line. And what's interesting is we see this emergence of, of these two different regions. The most interesting one is the, the red region, um, which is, the, if we find ourselves in this area, the bank fails due to illiquidity, uh, even though it would have been solvent. So this is a case where, in the event of a cyber attack, banks fail due to illiquidity, even though uh, they may have been solvent. Now, to solve the uh, decisions, or to solve for the equilibrium here, when is it that these fund managers would withdraw, we need to basically intersect their conservatism with the effective failure threshold, which is given by the envelope of these two curves here. And in this example, the conservatism is high enough that it intersects on the downward sloping uh, part of this red line. So in this case, failure is going to be driven by illiquidity. And given that, we have a certain failure threshold alpha star. If gamma was smaller, then the intersection may have been on the horizontal part, and then failure would have been driven by uh, insolvency instead. Now, turning to the initial period um, uh, choices, the attacker is going to choose how much to invest to try to find this bug and to uh, launch a cyber attack. Uh, and this gives us this quantity A star of S. The bank, in turn, is going to internalize what the attacker does and is going to choose S how much to invest in cybersecurity. And the object P of S here is the probability with which the bank 
is going to be successful in finding and patching up those vulnerabilities. So given this object P of S, I can now talk about what exactly is the trade-off driving the bank's choice. With probability P of S, the bank is going to be successful in this contest, and it's going to be able to patch up those vulnerabilities. In this case, the bank is able to obtain the full equity value. So the value of the assets minus what it has to pay the depositors. But with the converse probability, one minus P of S, the attacker is going to be successful. And in this case, the bank is going to be subject to these disruptions or these impairments. And the expected equity value is going to depend on the severity of those disruptions, which is why we have this integral over here. So the key trade-off here is that investing more in cybersecurity improves protection. That's the P of S term, or the chances of finding and patching up the vulnerability before the attacker. At the same time, it's going to reduce investments in profitable assets. So this is going to apply irrespective of who wins this tournament. But the second part is conditional on the attacker having successfully exploited the vulnerability. The bank is going to be less resilient and susceptible to failing. Why is this? Well, the bank has devoted more resources to cybersecurity to try to find the bug. It has invested less in these assets. So it has less available to repay those depositors when they choose to run. So resilience is potentially compromised um, by investing more in cybersecurity. So this is the kind of resilient protection resilience trade-off underlying the bank's choice uh, of investment. Um, we can solve the joint equilibrium in the interest of time. Let's assume it's all well-defined. Um, Coming to the normative implications of this model, what we want to do is try to understand how the bank's choice is going to uh, compare with that of a planner who would want to take into account the social costs of bank default, which the bank itself does not internalize. And um, for brevity, if I denote the planner's choice by SP, what we want to understand is how the bank's choice which I denote S double star, is going to depend, or how is it different from SP? And we're going to look at this in terms of how does it differ in term, with regards to this marginal cost of effort or the sophistication of the attacker. And there are two cases to consider here. What happens first when bank failure is going to be insolvency driven? So when bank failure is insolvency driven, the conditional likelihood of failure from following an attack is relatively low. So there are two regions here to sort of distinguish between. When C, the attacker is highly sophisticated. In this case, in the tournament, we can think of the bank as being an underdog. It's very likely that the bank is going to fail in this tournament because this attacker is so sophisticated. In this case, there are greater social benefits from devoting more resources towards resilience. So what we have here is that the bank actually overinvests in cybersecurity when it should have instead been uh, promoting its resilience instead. On the other hand, when the costs are higher uh, for the attacker, then the, uh, the chances of the bank winning this tournament are much higher. So the bank, if you will, is sort of top dog. Its ability to win in this tournament is higher. So the social benefits of investing more in protection are larger. So in this case, we would get that the bank actually under invests in cybersecurity. However, in the case when bank failure is illiquidity driven, we find that we always have that there's going to be under investment in cybersecurity. Why is this? Well, when failure is illiquidity driven, the conditional likelihood of failing is very high. And therefore, the social benefits of greater protection are also larger. So taking this into account and trying to understand what are the implications for policy in the space of kind of the attacker's cost of effort and rollover risk, we can distinguish in which regions would different types of policies, policies be optimal. So if we think about these cyber stress tests, where we want to assess the resilience of an institution, well, 
here, uh, we want to assess and also promote the resilience of the institution. This would typically apply when the attacker that you're facing is highly sophisticated. So in such a situation, trying to promote resilience or business continuity is sort of the preferred thing to do. But in other instances, you actually want to promote investment in cybersecurity. And here are things like subsidizing cybersecurity investment or using the sort of red teaming that I mentioned earlier would sort of be the socially optimal policy. So to very quickly conclude, uh, in this model, in this paper, we developed a model to study cybersecurity and financial stability. We argue that cybersecurity investment is subject to a novel protection versus resilience trade-off. We argue that the uh, private equilibrium is constrained inefficient, and therefore there is a role for supervision in cybersecurity. We extend our model in the paper in a number of different ways. One is to consider what happens when you have multiple banks. So here is where we have all of these different banks using the same software, which may or may not be provided by a third party vendor. And in this case, we argue that cybersecurity is a public good, and in particular, it's a best shot public good. And this is going to exacerbate the underinvestment in cybersecurity. And we also consider the role of nighty and uncertainty. So investors have no idea how to assess the likelihood of a cyber attack or not, uh, and find that the results sort of all go through. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our discussion is Ryan. So the, the question is really, how much do I invest in security, right? And there's a trade-off, right? The more I invest in security, the less I have for uh, resilience. And the trade-off is also then, well, it's sort of driven by the sophistication of the attacker, right? And so that's, I think, the crux of the, of the entire paper. Um, so, you know, the paper, I'm not going to summarize everything, but it looks at how cyber attacks can trigger bank runs, and we look at this trade-off between protection and resilience. And Kartik did a good job explaining that, and it gives a framework, which I think is good, because I'm an empiricist, I should have also said, as I'm not a theoretical person, I'm an empiricist. Um, and it gives a framework for regulators to think about ways to promote socially optimal investment by financial institutions, right? I mean, it's important. We saw some of the examples. We know that, you know, if I'm at a financial institution that's at risk of having the uh, assets being stolen, then it's bad for me personally. But then we can think about the sort of further social costs. What if it causes bank runs, right? What if, it, what if it affects not only me when my assets are stolen, but also everyone when a financial institution is, uh, is, is sort of too open to attack? Um, the model setup, I won't speak too much about it. Uh, Kardec did a good job, but there are three periods. Uh, bank raises deposits in period uh, zero, invests in risky projects in cybersecurity. So this is the trade-off, right? The more I invest in security, the less I can, um, I can invest in a risky project. There's uncertainty about the success and the bank's uh, ability. So it's, there's uncertainty in two ways about the success of the project, right? We don't know what the payoff of the risky project's gonna be which is normal, right? I mean, it could, it could be a good project, could be a bad project. And there's also uncertainty about the bank's ability to find and patch these vulnerabilities, right? So there's a game or a race, you could almost say, but it's mostly a game. Who can find the vulnerability first? And it's going to depend on how much I invest in it as an attacker, which is the A cost, and then how much uh, do I, in terms of um, a financial institution, invest in order to find it. Uh, depositors choose to roll over or withdraw their funds at T1 based on a public signal, and then we get our payoffs. So it's a fairly simple, I shouldn't say it's simple, it wasn't simple, but the setup anyways of the model is, uh, is simple and should be familiar to most people. Now, one of the things I think the role of a discussant is, is to try to interpret the tensions in the model, right? We look at a model, we think, oh yeah, this seems pretty clear, you know, maybe this is straightforward. What's the tension in the model? Well, the, one of the tensions in the model is this private versus social incentives for cybersecurity investment. So Kartik and I were talking about sort of this private and public good aspect of, uh, of investing in security. And so here there are private benefits to investing as a financial institution, but there are also public, um, public benefits or socially um, positive benefits for cybersecurity investment. Um, protection versus resilience, this is another key tension, right? I can't put everything into protection because then I don't have a risky project that I can invest in. I can't put everything, well, maybe I could, Kartik might be able to tell us if we can, but I can't put everything into resilience because then I'm completely exposed to, uh, to cyber attacks. 
Uh, and so there's this trade-off between these uh, between these two. And I, I kind of like this at the end, sort of this common IT platforms and this public good, um, public good nature. So I should say I have a paper also on cybersecurity. One of the reasons that I might be here. It's a theoretical paper, which is weird because I don't do theory, but I can tell you the story about how that happened later. Um, so I think this is an interesting tension uh, as well with the model. But I think five more minutes, okay. Uh, I'll try to be try to be a little bit quicker. Um, I think the key tension, though, really is this decision: how much do I invest uh, in in resilience, and how much do I invest in security? Key results: banks underinvest in cyber uh, security due to not internalizing the social costs of distress. Socially optimal cybersecurity depends on the threat severity and bank fragility. When rollover risk is low, bank failure is due to deadweight losses. When rollover risk is high. In inefficient runs concur after an attack. So this is really the, I would say, the macro prudential side of uh, things in terms of key results. Um, positioning in the literature, I think, you know, five years ago, you could go back and say there were very, very, very few cybersecurity papers, right? And since then, we've slowly developed, you know, there's some, uh, I would call them seminal papers or, or initial papers that sort of started it. But since then, there's sort of a lot of literature that, that's, uh, that's come up. So this paper builds on the literature that looks at cyber risk and financial stability. So there's the Duffy paper. We talked about that on cyber, um, cyber risk runs. Uh, Eisenbach paper, there's a go at all paper. Um, it relates also to the economics of information security literature. So there was this earlier literature that, uh, that this is sort of building upon. Um, it looks at network security and contagion. Right? So it's not just we're looking at security in isolation. We're looking at the effects of our security decisions on other financial institutions or on other members in an individual network. Um, and it looks at the policy on, uh, on cyber regulation. Right, This is also relatively new. How do we regulate financial institutions or how do we regulate policy in general? Right, Because when we regulate, there's also unintended consequences. And what are they? Right, We can say, well, here we've got a minimum level of security investment. Well, that might be an overinvestment which leads to you know, a lack of resilience. So thinking about these things through and placing this paper in that literature, I think is important. Um, policy implications, maybe I can just uh, um, go over these quickly as well. Um, but operational resilience standards will help us to make sure that we have adequate security investment, although they're kind of hard to, uh, hard to calibrate. Red team, I need to Google this, right? I was like, red team, I saw it five times in the paper. I'm like, what is a red team? Finally. This isn't really a complaint, Kartik, but maybe you could put it in the intro. Explain to someone what a red team is. So a red team is when someone um, um, basically delegates an attack or a simulated attack on a financial institution. It's like, hack me. Figure out how to do this, right? And so I can imagine how red team works. I just can't imagine how that's not going to sort of require us to invest just as many resources as an attacker to find these vulnerabilities, right? So if I'm not investing as much as the attacker, I'm unlikely to be able to find the same sort of vulnerabilities that an attacker would find. So I, I mean, I get it as a policy implication. I just don't really get how it fits into the model. Um, subsidies to enhance bank cyber uh, capabilities funded by lump sum taxes. Sure, sounds like a good idea to me. And negligence rules with penalties for inadequate. So this is just sort of, you know, two sides of the of, of the same coin is right. You know, either we're going to subsidize or we're going to find another way to have the bank subsidize this investment. But the idea is to get more investment, it seems, which sometimes seems counterintuitive to, well, sometimes we're also in a region where we're over investing, right? Because these are almost all costs, additional costs. One minute. OK, I'll go really quick now. Uh, extensions. So Kartik did add a little bit of the extensions. But uh, I really like some of the, the extensions. Um, so uncertainty, right? I don't know what the probability of attack is. And I think that's actually kind of fair to say, right? Is that we don't quite know. And as an empiricist, I know we don't know. What's the distribution of attacks? What's the likelihood of them being successful? I don't think we actually know the distribution yet. So having some uncertainty around this is actually important. And, and it doesn't, the important thing is it doesn't change the core insight of the paper. So if you believe everything that's going on in the paper, uncertainty doesn't change any of that. Um, lender of last resort supports rollover risk, but doesn't address the underinvestment. This is important. Common IT platforms across banks ne necessitate mapping infrastructures and setting standards. One thing or one issue I kind of have with common IT platforms is it actually makes it much easier. I think it would increase 
the systematic portion of the risk, right? We, we get this, we can, you know, we've got a common IT platform across multiple institutions. We have to invest less, right, because we've got some scale effects. But if we do find a vulnerability, well, we just found a vulnerability not just in one financial institution, but in two, five. One minute left, is that one? It's the zero. Okay, so I will go. Limitations, critiques, no one wants to see those anyways. Future directions, conclusion. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. I th actually thought it was a great paper. I know everyone says that when they discuss the paper, and they should. Really made me think. I think that was the important thing. It should make all of us think. Is it perfect? No. Is it good? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Sorry for cutting you off. Um, thanks. Um, right. Questions, comments? Yes, Klaus. You can. Thanks a lot for presenting this very interesting paper. I have one question on this transmission mechanism through reduction of the asset values. I wonder why you don't um, consider as an alternative, um, which might be very intuitive, to say there is a shock to the market value of equity because if there is a tech, this becomes public, reputation risk materializes, and then through this shock to the market value of equity, you can still find um, a line of argument that leads you to a liquidity run on the bank. Uh, would this change things? Just a question, thank you. Okay, yes, Wilco. Thanks, yeah, um, great presentation, great paper. I was just wondering about the hacker it's himself or herself. Um, you say uh, in the model it's a risk neutral person. I'm not sure if hackers are risk neutral mm -hmm. or probably not risk averse, but um, so is that sort of a complication, but also on the hacking side, is there a probability that he or she gets caught. So that would perhaps also um, guide his own behavior a bit, if there is a probability that in the end he gets uh, caught and go to jail. Um, and that you could perhaps also relate that to the price, which is now exogenous. Um, look, if the hacker is able to trigger a bank run, would that increase his price or not? You know, where um, you could sort of argue, by in a, perhaps a long stretch, that also the price money is endogenous to the outcome. Yes, please. So going back on this attacker, could I think it's unrealistic, but could banks be attackers, and would that change the dynamics? of the model if they wouldn't only be able to invest in the protection of, but also maybe attack other banks. And there was somebody here, yes. Okay, yeah, first in the Okay, uh, thank you for, for this paper and the nice presentation and this uh, sort of analysis. Um, and I apologize in advance if, if it's a stupid question and I got it, didn't got it. Uh, no stupid questions. Uh, fully, uh, but uh, my question is, if I understood it right, you argue with mainly with expected values, but um, if we consider the the outcome and the risk of a cyber attack, shouldn't be a measure like the value at risk or something like that, uh, the tail of the distribution, the right measure. Um, and when you argue with the with the expectation, you eventually underestimate the risk and the costs of such an attack. And the second question is, what is uh, if the costs between attack and defense are asymmetric? So normally defense is more costly than attacking. Wouldn't that change uh, your outcome? Thank you. Thank you. And then final question over there. Oh, thank you. Uh, interesting paper. Uh, I'm a bit puzzled be, uh, with this uh, trade-off between cybersecurity and recovery or, or resilience after an attack. Uh, to me, uh, we, we supervisors focus both on the probability of default and on the loss given default. And it looks to me like uh, we are focusing on one 
uh, or the or the other here. We, when I talk with with my colleagues, experts in IT supervision, uh, what they tell me is that that investments uh, reducing the probability of an attack and investments uh, favoring the recovery after an attack are complements, and, and sometimes the same investment can lead to to both. So for me, it, it is a bit puzzling. I, I would like you to develop a, a bit more on this. Okay, well, I have um, also two comments myself. Um, the first, the utility function of the attacker. I mean, does it really have to be price money? I mean, isn't, isn't having a, for certain um, foreign, I guess we can call them foreign players, just causing a meltdown of the financial system is the price, right? So, um, but it, I'm just wondering whether this, how does this model? Uh, the other question I had, so when I, when, while you were talking, um, uh, I, I noted down subsidies, and then you actually mentioned it yourself. Now, these different policy options that you mentioned, I mean, this is almost like a new paper. Can you actually compare them in terms of what is most efficient, cost-effective, uh, incentive-compatible, uh, and so on? So, over to you. Two minutes. Yeah? Thanks. Well, thank you very much for all the questions and the great discussion. Um, let me see. Where shall I start? So, one question that was asked earlier was from the attacker's incentives. Um, what happens if the attacker cares, worries about being caught? One of the things that has been talked about in the literature on cyber risk is what's called the attribution problem. It's very, very hard to attribute an attack to a particular entity. Um, there's been some research about this, uh, but the general view is that because it's hard to attribute, it is then kind of very, you can then argue that attackers' views of concerns on being caught and penalized are very low. And that's perhaps also why we take such an approach and not really consider um, the, the, the cost of being caught from an attacker's perspective. Um, let me see some of the others. Um, so, okay, I want to address the comment that you raised that it's puzzling. So what you mentioned is very true very often um, investments that are made to cybersecurity can in t at times be redeployed to improve resilience. So if we think of you, you have a team of people who are trying to kind of find these vulnerabilities in the event of an attack, you could redeploy them. The core assumption that we make over here is that these cybersecurity investments are effectively sunk costs, right? You make these costs and then you cannot redeploy them. So the type of investment that we have in mind here, as I mentioned on the slides, are things like you pay kind of these hackers, these red team uh, people to sort of come. So you, you set aside a bunch of money, you set aside a bunch of money for these bug bounties and so forth. So those you cannot, in the spur of the moment, redeploy. So that's kind of the specific nature of cybersecurity investment that we consider. But what you say is well taken, that there are other types of investments that would in that would lead to a complementarity between these two and we are silent about that but perhaps we should acknowledge that this is a limitation of our framework um tail risk so we do consider both the ex post and the ex ante uh, sort of perspective like the ex post is what drives the runs themselves uh, and the ex ante perspective is kind of the investment in cybersecurity. on the tail risk side I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but we assume that the distribution of this impairment is a uniform distribution. If you will, that's a distribution with a very large tail ultimately, right? So from an ex ante perspective, what we are assuming is that you don't know what kind of impairment you might suffer. So this is in a kind of very reduced form way accounting for the notion of tail risk. And I would leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Let's give again a hand up. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, and I want to actually just very quickly, as I should go, oh yes, can I actually talk from here or not? Yes, I can talk from here, good, okay. I want to, before I give over to, uh, uh, to Luke, um, very quickly introduce a new initiative that we started uh, in the context of the cooperation between ECB Bank Supervision and the EUI, which is a new um, working paper series, banking supervision policy working paper series, which is standalone, it's not uh, related to the ECB. Um, uh, working paper and occasional paper uh, series, so there's no competition substitute, whatever, so this is uh, standalone. Um, and just mention very 
briefly, um, this is a, a series where we would like to focus specifically on papers, policy briefs, notes that focus on banking supervision to also in this context strengthen the link between academic community and, uh, uh, and uh, supervision. Open to both ECB, e uh, NCA, and more generally um, academics uh, uh, in uh, um, well, the NCA staff across the uh, SSM uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, I'm very proud and very happy to announce that our first paper will be by, uh, authored by uh, Vito Constancio on the 10 years journey of the banking union, which is, uh, of course, also the theme of this conference. So I think it fits uh, very nicely. There are a couple of other papers currently under review. We are uh, trying to figure out last details. So it's, it's going to take a couple, um, one or two more weeks to do that. Um, again, uh, this is, um, as also with other working papers here, it's a very light process, uh, not, not like the, the academic journals. Um, just putting it up here. Again, for more information, you can either ask this nice gentleman, where is he actually there standing here, or you can ask me in the lunch break. Uh, 